All right, everyone. Thank you all for joining and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Saving Pollinators One Garden at a Time. Um, today, David Mizajewski, National Wildlife Federation's naturalist, will be pre presenting on how you can help um, bees, butterflies, and other pollinators right in your own garden. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of the webinar, Dave will leave some time, David will leave some time to answer any of your, your questions. Um, David holds a degree in human and natural ecology from Emory University and has hosted television series on both Animal Planet and Nat Geo Wild. He regularly appears on NBC's Today Show and does dozens of other media appearances each year to promote wildlife conservation throughout natural gardening. He specializes in urban ecology and the role that native plants have on wildlife populations and helping people restore wildlife habitat in their cities, towns, neighborhoods, backyards, and gardens, which is also the subject of his best-selling garden book, Garden How-To Book, Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Wildlife. Um, so now I can go ahead and turn it over to David um, for the presentation. Thanks, Erin. Hi, everyone. I'm so, so excited to be here with you, you guys today. Um, it's National Pollinator Week. This is a week that is celebrated every year. And as the name would suggest, it's all about trying to, you know, kind of celebrate and raise awareness about pollinators. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today, about how we all can make a difference for pollinators, many of which are uh, in having declines in their populations, right outside our own doors by planting a wildlife habitat garden specifically to meet the needs of these pollinating wildlife. So before I get into the details of that, I wanna just start by uh, introducing you to the National Wildlife Federation. If you're not familiar, we're one of the oldest and largest wildlife conservation groups in America. We do focus our program work here in North America uh, it sets us apart from a lot of other conservation groups with a more global focus. And this is our mission, to unite all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrive in a rapidly changing future. And it's probably not a big surprise to hear that we human beings are a large part of that rapid change that's having such a negative impact on wildlife. And I'm not gonna lie, the news is pretty grim. We're having a, an extinction crisis on this, on this planet. There's over a million species right now endangered with extinction. Here in the US, we've got um, you know, over one third of our wildlife are at increased risk of extinction in the coming decades because of human activity. Um, the bee populations have plummeted. The rusty patched bumblebee has the dubious distinction of being the very first North American bee species to be listed as endangered. And we just don't have data on a lot of other pollinator, pollinator species. Um, and that's kind of a scary thing. Monarch butterflies, you've probably heard, are also in big trouble. I'm gonna talk about them. Uh, later on in the presentation. And so, you know, it is bad news and it is disheartening, but I'm here to challenge all of us because we can do something about it. We all can make a difference by planting a wildlife habitat garden and it really does make a difference. So that's what I'm going to dive into today. So the National Wildlife Federation, we do our work in all sorts of different ways. We work back in Washington DC fighting for good wildlife policy and legislation. We do species specific campaigns, um, you know, things uh, we're working right now to reintroduce bison to their native habitat on America's grasslands and working with our state affiliate, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation to protect critically endangered red wolves in that state. We're working to build highway overpass, uh, highway overpasses in California to help the dwindling mountain lion population there. We're working to protect America's great waters, whether it's Puget Sound or the Great Lakes or the Chesapeake Bay or the Gulf of Mexico, and all of the wildlife species that rely on that, and people too. Now you'll notice a lot of the species I just mentioned, and the one you're seeing on the picture here, eagles and wolves and mountain lions, they're kind of what we traditionally think of when we think of wildlife, you know, mammals, birds, furry, feathered, big animals. But guess what? This is wildlife too. This is the monarch butterfly that I was just mentioning a second ago. And you might not think of them as such, but insects are wildlife. And in fact, they're one of the most diverse and important groups of wildlife that exist on this planet. Um, it's not an overstatement to say that without insects, life as we know it would not exist as it does today. And so insects happen to be a group of wildlife that can, be, can particularly benefit 
by what you do in your own yard or garden space. And that's something that's really important to keep in mind. We have to have a broad definition of wildlife when we think about a wildlife habitat garden. Now, that brings me to the National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife program. This is a program that we've been doing since 1973. And it's really all about helping people get involved locally and help people help the wildlife that is local to where they live. And, um, you know, it really was originally envisioned as a way to combat some of the habitat destruction that was happening by urban and suburban development. Um, and so this is the program that the National Wildlife Federation has that focuses on wildlife conservation in what I call the human dominated landscape, as opposed to off in the wilderness. So this is our work that focuses on helping wildlife where people like are saying is where people live, work, play and pray, right? Th these are, this is wildlife that can safely coexist with us in our cities and towns and neighborhoods and yes, in our own yards. And so that's what the Garden for Wildlife program is all about that's been going on for these past 47 years. Now it's oftentimes confusing to people when you talk about wildlife in the context of gardening because if you follow traditional gardening, you know, we're taught you don't want wildlife. They're going to destroy everything. They're going to eat my, my plants. They're going to eat everything in sight. So here's why the National Wildlife Federation as a conservation group is involved in a garden effort. It's because plants are the foundation of habitat for all wildlife species, including pollinators. And that's true everywhere, not just off in the wilderness, but that's true in our cities and towns and neighborhoods and backyards as well. It all starts with plants, the bottom of the food web that supports everything else um, along that web. After the plants, those insects, which are important wildlife in and of themselves and deserve habitat, those, those insects are the next kind of level in the food web beyond the plants. They're the first real major protein source in the food web. And the reality is, is that most insects that rely on plants for their own survival can only use plants that they co-evolved with over the course of hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Over 90% of insects rely on those plants that you know, are native to where they are. And that brings me to the concept, oh, before I get to that concept, um, going along the food web. Um, I, you know, I was mentioning how uh, insects are that first protein source. Birds, most of us love seeing birds in our backyards, right? So 96% of our backyard birds feed their babies insects or other invertebrates, mostly caterpillars of moths followed by butterflies. So again, you begin to see the importance of having the right plants that are going to support the insects, which is good for the insect populations and those species, but it's also good for all the other species further along the web that rely on the insects as a food source. So that brings me to the idea of native plants. Um, I don't know how savvy you guys all are with Zoom, but um, let me see a show of hands if you're familiar with the concept of native plants. Fantastic. I love this because a couple months ago, before we all became Zoom experts, I probably wouldn't have had any response there. Um, so native plants are simply the plants that naturally evolved in your region. North America has you know, a couple dozen ecoregions, and each of those regions has a slightly different plant palette that, again, evolved there in those conditions over huge spans of geological time. So what that means is that native plants, because they naturally belong where you are, are adapted to the types of native soils. They're adapted to the climate and the weather patterns. They're adapted to the levels of rainfall and precipitation, and of course, they're adapted to the life cycles of the wildlife that are also native to their habitat. And that's critically important. Let me give you an example. Now this, um, and, and if some of you guys might be familiar with the work of Dr. Doug Tallamy. He's been a great partner to the National Wildlife Federation and I'm using a lot of the results of his studies. And so you might um, be familiar with some of these, but just to illustrate how important native plants are for wildlife, Look at oaks, the genus Quercus here in North America serve as the caterpillar host plant. In other words, the only food that caterpillars of certain species can feed on uh, for 557 different species of moths and butterflies. That's all collectively, all of our native oaks. So compare that to something like a ginkgo, an ancient species used to be found in North America, but 
that was again long ago in geological time. It doesn't really fit here in the eco ecology of North America anymore, but it's still a commonly cultivated and planted street tree. It doesn't support any species of butterflies and moths anymore. So again, you begin to see the power of plant choice when it comes to supporting wildlife and pollinators in particular. Because remember, those caterpillars turn into butterflies and moths, which are, a, a, which are pollinators. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. So this is what it boils down to and why a wildlife conservation group has a garden program. It's because wildlife need native plants to survive. The act of planting something for a purpose is really the definition of gardening, right? So if you plant vegetables, because you, you want to eat tomatoes and eggplants and broccoli or whatever, um, although some of those are fruits, um, you're a vegetable gardener. If you plant native plants because you want to support the pollinator population, well, that makes you a wildlife gardener. And that's what this is all about. The Garden for Wildlife program is really all about encouraging everybody out there to plant with a purpose. And that purpose is habitat restoration for those wildlife species that can coexist with us in harmony. So all wildlife species need four things to survive. They're food, water, cover, and places where they can engage in courtship and mating and nest building and egg laying and everything that falls under the kind of this broad heading raise their young. Um, these are the four things that you want to provide if you want to support wildlife. And I'm going to talk, give you some specifics on how to do that for pollinators as we get further on in this presentation. But if you provide those four things and you commit to gardening in a natural, sustainable way, well, those are the things that you need to do in order to earn certified wildlife habitat status for your yard or garden. Um, I'll tell you how to do that at the very end, but I want you to pay attention to the next slide. We're doing a really fun promo in honor of National Pollinator Week um, for the entire month of June. And so if you do want to get your yard or garden space certified by the National Wildlife Federation, um, we're having a discount. Uh, you can get 20% off the, the fee and the, uh, for the application and also for the sign. Those fees, by the way, are go, go right back into our program. It's one of the ways as a nonprofit that we fund this Garden for Wildlife work that we're doing. So I just want you to know that the money's going right back uh, in to support all this really great work. But at any rate, take a screenshot of this or jot down the website. It's nwf.org slash certify. You can enter in the promo card code GARDEN20 and you'll automatically get a 20% dis discount, excuse me. Um, I'm gonna show this slide again at the end. So if you didn't get it, no worries, I'll show it again. But I wanted to share that at the top. All right, so let's talk about pollinators. So what are pollinators? You've probably heard the term a lot, but you might not be completely familiar with exactly what it means. So pollinators are animals that visit plants, flowering plants specifically, to get a meal in the form of flower nectar and also pollen. And in doing so, they actually move pollen from one flower to the next. And that allows the plants, that actually fertilizes those flowers and is the way that plants have, again, co-evolved with their native pollinators so that the plants can reproduce. You know, plants are not like animals. They can't go out and find a mate, right? So they rely on, in some cases, wind. Some species of plants just let their pollen grains, which is their reproductive material, kind of go out in the wind and hope that it lands on another flower. But flowering plants develop those flowers to attract wild animals to come and, and the nectar inside as a reward to come and actually get dusted with their pollen and move it from plant to plant. So they play a critically important role in the ecosystem because without these pollinating animals, all of the flowering plants out there would not be able to reproduce. Think about that. Um, you know, 80 to 90 percent of our flowering plants rely on animal pollinators exclusively to move their pollen and reproduce. And even beyond just the reproduction part and making sure that our plant communities are able to you know, continue to thrive and spread, um, those plants, when they, when they are fertilized, their seeds are oftentimes packaged in food sources. And there's a whole other layer of wildlife interaction where you know, a plant that produces a nut or a fruit or a berry or a seed of some sort um, that is surrounded by nutritious food that the plant then uses a different set of wildlife. So animals that are going to eat the berries and the seeds and the nuts, and then in doing so spread the plant seeds around. So again, the plants can kind of keep their populations healthy. 
So those, it, without pollinators, not only would plant populations crash, but all the wildlife that rely on those plants for food, as we talked about earlier, would also lose a food source, and oftentimes the food source that they have available to them. So it's really that important. And like I said earlier, it's not hyperbole to say that without pollinators, life as we know it on this planet just wouldn't exist. If they all disappear tomorrow, and many of them are going that route, it's gonna have, it would have significant negative impacts on our ecosystem, trickling all the way up to us humans who, you know, kind of are at the top of that food web. So let's talk about who the pollinators are. This is one of my favorite parts because most of us are probably aware that bees are pollinators, but there's a lot of other animals out there, even right here in North America, that play this critical role um, in pollination. So in addition to bees, you might not know that wasps are pollinators. Bees actually evolved from wasps. Um, and bees are kind of, if you, if you want to think about it this way, they're kind of like the vegetarian descendants of wasps. Most wasps, in addition to visiting flowers and serving as pollinators, are also predators or parasites of other insects. So they actually, you know, are really beneficial to have around, even though they can sting you. Um, bees, of course, don't do that. They feed on just the nectar and the pollen. But so bees are pollinators. Wasps are pollinators. Flies are pollinators. And these guys might have tricked you. You might have seen a pollinating fly and thought it was a bee because many of them are mimics of bees and wasps. And that likely is because bees and wasps can sting and by, by kind of faking it and looking like a bee or a wasp, it provides a level of protection to these flies. They're called flower flies or hovered flies or surfeit flies. And beyond, after the bees, um, <clears throat> they're some of our most important pollinators. Another tip I can give you to help identify them if, you know, because these, these insects move really quickly. So sometimes all you see is the flash of, of yellow and black and you think bee, but note on this picture how the, bee, the fly's eyes meet in the middle of their head. For bees and wasps, their eyes do not do that. They're on the side. So that's one ID tip. And then the other thing is that flies only have one pair of wings, whereas the wasps and bees have a double set of wings. So just a couple tips on insect identification. So you can go outside and try to spot the differences between the pollinating flies and the pollinating bees and wasps. So bees, wasps, flies. This is one that you're probably not going to be happy to hear about, but it is true that mosquitoes do serve as pollinators. And you know, you might be thinking, wait, mosquitoes drink blood. Well, here's the deal. Only the female mosquito actually seeks out a blood meal. And she only does that because she needs the protein in order to lay her eggs. Um, otherwise, pollinators, and, and this is true for males, male pollinators, they feed on flower nectar, just like a bee or a fly or a butterfly or something like that. Now, the good news is, is that I'm certainly not suggesting that we want to you know, encourage and protect and attract mosquitoes to our yard. Um, the good news is that there really are, aren't any um, species of plants that are really exclusively dependent on mosquitoes uh, there might be one or two orchids out there, but they're not the kind of things that you would find in, you know, cultivation to plant in your yard. But, you know, the more you know, and so they do, you know, people always ask, well, what role, you know, why do mosquitoes exist? What role do they play? Well, they, they play that role. They can, they can be sort of minor pollinators. So just wanted to share that. Um, so here's a, one of my favorite groups of pollinators that, again, most people might not know about. So it's the bees, the wasps, the flies, um, and then beetles. There's a whole bunch of beetles that do the same thing. They visit flowers to get nectar and pollen, and in doing so, they move it from place to place and fertilize. Um, in fact, there is a whole group of beetles called flower beetles, and you can see why. So they're pretty neat as well. Of course, butterflies are pollinators, like this fritillary. Moths are pollinators, like this hummingbird moth. And I I want to take one second to give a shout out to moths because butterflies really hog up all of the attention when it comes to the Lepidopteran world. That's the, you know, the, the group of insects known as butterflies and moths. Moths or butterflies like, like bees evolved out of wasps, butterflies actually evolved from moths. And there's way more moth species. And yes, many of them are kind of nondescript and tiny and brown or gray and most butterflies are more colorful, but there's a lot of moths out there like this hummingbird moth. 
um, that are pretty fantastic and in terms of their appearance and their color. Um, and just by sheer numbers, moths are much more important ecologically than butterflies. There's more species of them out there. And so they're doing more pollination and their caterpillars are a more important food source for all of those backyard birds we mentioned a few minutes ago. So um, so little shout out to the, the moths out there. Hopefully people will appreciate them more. Moving beyond insects, here in North America, hummingbirds are pollinators. And hummingbirds are really such a beautiful example of this idea of co-evolution. Hummingbirds tend to be attracted to flowers that have long tubular flowers, like the coral honeysuckle that you see this ruby-throated hummingbird feeding on. And it's no surprise because the hummingbirds have that really long beak and a long little tongue that sticks out. It's like two pieces of the puzzle fitting together. That's what we mean by co-evolution. You know, if you don't have one piece of the puzzle, the native plant, then the wildlife can't survive and vice versa. If you don't have the wildlife pollinator that's specific to the plant, then the plant can't survive either. So they really go hand in hand and it really underscores just how important native plants are for supporting pollinators and, and all wildlife. Here's a, a surprising one. There are some bats that are pollinators as well. Now, if you're not gonna see this in most parts of the country, but if you live down in Arizona or New Mexico, um, there are two bat species that range as far north as those two states that are nectar feeders. They feed on the flowers of things like cactus and agave. It's the uh, Mexican long-tongued and the lesser long-nosed bat. There are other pollinating bats in other parts of the world, but that is just something that I think is kind of fascinating. In other parts of the world, there are other mammals, uh, possums and things like that, that um, also serve as pollinators. But here in North America, these two bats are pretty much the, um, you know, the only two mammalian pollinators. Pretty neat. All right, so as I mentioned, bees are our most important pollinator. They are the most numerous, um, and the most kind of closely co-evolved with plants. They have these little furry bodies that are designed basically to hang on to all the pollen. Many of them have uh, structures in their legs called pollen baskets that allow them to gather the pollen, which they feed to their babies. But again, in doing so, they're moving it from plant to plant to plant. Um, all the other animals that I mentioned are important pollinators, but they just by, again, sheer numbers of bees, there's 20,000 bee species on this planet and 4,000 roughly species found here in North America. Um, so they're just, they're doing the bulk of that pollination work um, and, and so therefore are just critically important. But everything you know about bees or think you know about bees is wrong. And here's why. <laughs> the reason that I say that, and you know, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit here, but there's, there's some truth to it. So the reason for that is that most of what we know about bees is based on a species that's the exception to the rule in the bee world. That's the honeybee. So honeybees are native to Europe and uh, parts of North Africa, Eurasia. And um, they, and here in North America, they were brought over by European colonists for their agricultural services. So their pollination services of crops, their production of honey, their production of beeswax. And so they've only been here for, you know, essentially a few hundred years. And therefore they're not a native species here in North America. In order to be native somewhere, again, we're talking geological spans of time that a species has to sort of co-evolve with everything around it. You know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years. So a few hundred years is nothing evolutionarily speaking. So honeybees essentially um, are a domesticated species here in North America. They, the majority of them exist in managed honeybee hives that again are really important for agriculture, but um, you know, there might be some honeybees that have escaped into the wild, but you know, those are really feral domesticated animals like feral pigs or feral you know, cats or whatever, right? And so you really can't think of them as wild. I think about it like this, you know, a uh, uh, a honeybee is to a wild native bee as a cow is to a bison. So from that point of view, as a wildlife conservation group, our focus at the National Wildlife Federation is on our wild native bee species. I mentioned there's over, there's roughly 4,000 4, of them. And most people don't know anything about them. Uh, most people only know about the honeybee. So 
here's what I mean when I say most of what we think we know about bees is wrong. Most bees are not black and yellow or striped the way a honeybee is. I mean, some are, but a lot of them are not. A lot of them come in these really cool colors. A lot of them are metallic, green or gold or blue or just solid black. Some of them have red on them. Some of them have orange on them. Um, so they, bees come in a whole diversity of different colors, not just black and yellow. Bees don't form hives, at least not the majority of them. So this is something that um, is, is wildly different between most bee species and honeybees. So honeybees are what we call social bees. Most bee species are not social bees. Something like 90% of bee species on this planet are what we consider solitary bees. And so that means they're not forming a hive, they don't have a queen, um, they're not making honey. Again, all the things that we think of bees doing, most bees don't actually do that. Um, the honeybees do it, the bumblebees do it, and there are many um, bumblebee species native here in North America. Sweat bees sometimes will form kind of loose, loose hive kind of things. Um, but most of our native bees, again, 90% of them are solitary. And what those bees are doing um, is that the, the male and the female mate, and then the female is, seeks out a nest all by herself. Again, no sisters, no coworkers, no queens involved. And what she will do is lay her eggs in a tunnel in a series of little chambers. And she provisions each chamber with a little ball of pollen mixed with some nectar. And she lays an egg on that and then she builds a chamber wall and she fills the tunnel with a whole series of those chambers. And that's it. And then she's gone. She doesn't care for her young. Again, she doesn't rely on her hive to take care of them. So most of these solitary bees, again, 90% of the bee species, um, something like 75% of them are nesting in tunnels in the ground. You know, individual bees in little tunnels in the ground. Now, yeah, sometimes some of these solitary bees will, if the habitat is there, the good nesting habitat, will have their individual tunnels close to each other. And it might look like there's uh, a, a lot of activity and kind of a social grouping, but they're really operating on their own. So that's 75% of solitary bees. The other 25% are doing the same thing, but instead of in tunnels in the ground, they're laying their eggs and creating little nest chambers in tunnels in dead trees or fallen logs, hollowed out plant stems, places like that. So to review, bees are not black and yellow. Bees don't make honey. Bees don't form hives. Um, these are true statements for the vast majority of bee species. Um, the other thing that's different about most bees and honeybees is that while the females can sting, the stinger is actually a modified ovipositor, which is the organ that the bees use to lay their eggs. Um, so therefore males don't have them, only females do. While most of these native wild bees, um, the females can sting, they almost never do. Because stinging is really something that the social bees have evolved um, from their wasp progenitors as a defensive mechanism to protect their hives and their honey and their larvae and all of that. Well, these wild native solitary bees don't really have anything to protect. And so while they can sting, you'd really have to like grab one in your hand and like really shake it up or something like that to get them to sting you. It almost never happens. So in addition to bees not being black and yellow, bees not living in hives, bees not making honey, bees don't sting either. So. The other thing about our wild native bees is that many of them are plant specialists. So again, roughly 25% of bee species out there have specific, such specific relationships with native plants that they cannot survive without those native plants. Now, you know, again, the majority of bees are what we call generalists, meaning that they can go out and find nectar and gather pollen at a wide variety of different plants. But these roughly 25% of bee species that are pollen specialists can only gather the pollen to feed their young from specific plants. Good example are squash bees. Squash bees are native here in North America, just like wild squash plants, and that are the you know, sort of ancestors of the cultivated squash that we enjoy as a, as a garden vegetable. But um, these bees are co-evolved with, with members of the squash plant family, and to this day are their primary pollinators, including our crops. So that's pretty fascinating. So this is a squash bee, 
And what's really neat about them, I just think it's so cute. The, the bees at nighttime, they'll crawl inside of the squash flowers. And if you've ever grown you know, squash or zucchini or something like that, you know they have these big yellow flowers that at nighttime, as dusk comes, the flowers close up. So these bees, the squash bees, go inside the flower and then the flower closes on them and they can sleep safely, spend the night. And then in the morning when the sun comes up, the flowers open again and the bees go about their business. It's so cool, right? So squash bees, pollen specialists. So a little bit more about, again, our native wild bees. Really, really important. Most people don't know anything about them. Um, again, we just know about the honeybee. So I wanna make sure that everybody out there is thinking about you know, all of these cool bee species, the squash bees and the mason bees and the leafcutter bees and the alfalfa bees and the blueberry bees and all of these really amazing wild native bee species. They need our help too. Um, and so your pollinator garden can really be critical local habitat for them. All right, so I'm gonna go through the, now the specifics of how to provide those four components of habitat, food, water, cover, and places to raise young for our pollinators. So it's pretty straightforward as you're gonna see. How do you provide food for pollinators? Plant native blooming plants. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, you know, the, the bees, the butterflies, the beetles, the flies, the hummingbirds, all they need in order to find food are native blooming plants. And what you wanna do is think seasonally. So you wanna be planting, have, have plants in your yard or garden, some that bloom in the early spring for the early emerging bees. Then you want ones that bloom in the summer months right now. Um, for the bees that are active in the summer months. And you even want things that bloom from the late summer into the early fall up until the frost, like this aster. This happens to be aromatic aster. Really beautiful plant cultivated, so you can buy it in garden centers and happens to be really important as a food source, a late season food source for pollinators. So it's as simple as that. Plant lots of wonderful native wildflowers, flowering trees, flowering shrubs, and you'll be providing lots and lots of food sources for all of those wonderful native pollinators. How about this plant? How many of you have butterfly bush in your garden? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, a handful of folks. Okay, a bunch of you guys, yeah. So I have some bad news for you. This is not a plant that we recommend that you put out um, at the National Wildlife Federation. And the reason for it is that though it certainly is attractive to butterflies, it is a non-native species, um, originally from Asia, I think probably from China. And unfortunately, it has become a non-native invasive species in many parts of the US. What an invasive species is ecologically is a species that was brought far from its native range by human activity, where the species has become so established that it kind of escapes the garden and gets out into wild areas. And you would think, oh, well, diversity is a good thing. Let's have you know, one more plant out there in nature. But in, in terms of, of, of ecology, it doesn't really work that way because what happens with invasive plants is that they are able to dominate and essentially outcompete all of the native plants. And as a net result, diversity actually goes down. And as butterfly bush takes over woodlands and the mid-Atlantic, or it's actually kind of really bad out in the Pacific Northwest. If you live out there, I'm sure you've seen it growing along the highways. It'll, it eliminates habitat for the native plants that many other wildlife species survive on. So while it's kind of like a fast food snack by providing nectar to say butterflies, in the grand scheme of things, it probably is doing more harm than good. And the good news is, is that there's lots of other native blooming plants, shrubs and wildflowers that are equally attractive as a nectar source, and that might also be a caterpillar host plant um, or a, a pollen source for those, those uh, native bee uh, pollen specialists. So try to avoid this. I'm not gonna tell you to go out and rip it out, um, but if you did, that wouldn't be a bad thing. And try not to plant it, try to focus on planting natives. The other way that your plants are gonna provide food for pollinators is what I was just mentioning, caterpillar host plants. So back at the beginning, remember I was talking about oaks. Oaks serve as the caterpillar host plant for 557 species of butterflies and moths. Willows are really important as well. Um, things like goldenrods and those asters are ne nectar sources, but also host plant. 
So caterpillars, again, through the process of coevolution, have basically adapted to be able to only feed on the leaves of certain plants. Plants make chemicals so that, it, that insects won't eat them, the leaves that is. And so by specializing in, in developing an immunity to the toxins of just a certain number of plants, that means that butterflies and moths will always have a steady food source for their caterpillars. But it means that they can't eat any other plant. So you, what you want to do if you want to support the butterfly and moth population is not only plant the nectar plants for the adults, you also want to plant the caterpillar host plants. And they're different for every species. Some species can eat a whole bunch of plants, like a tiger swallowtail. Other species can only feed on one, one kind of native plant, like a monarch butterfly, which can only feed on milkweed. I'm going to get to monarchs in a second. So how do you provide food for pollinators? Plant lots of blooming plants that bloom in three seasons or, or more, um, and plant those caterpillar host plants as well. Make sure that they're all native. You can supplement that with a fruit feeder. A lot of butterflies actually don't feed on flower nectar. Butterflies that evolved in woodland environments tend, that don't get a lot of sun, and therefore they don't get a lot of blooming plants. Those species have kind of evolved to feed on other things, things that are as delicious sounding as sap and animal dung and rotting carcasses, all of which are filled with nutrients. And as that dung and the rotting carcasses kind of liquefy, it becomes a food source for butterflies um, and you know, rotting fruit as well. So that's what this fruit feeder kind of mimics. Um, you, know, you don't have to do this. This happens to be a photo from a butterfly house. So a lot of those are tropical species in addition to the monarch. But if you wanted to get like a bird bath or a shallow dish, get some mashed banana or melon or something like that. If it's overripe, it's fine. Add a little bit of water to it. You can even add a splash of wine or something like that because the alcohol um, puts off a scent that is the same as fermenting fruit. And you might attract in some butterflies this way. You might also attract wasps or your local raccoons or bears or things like that. So if that happens, you want to take this down. But you, know, you can experiment with this and see if it works for you. For hummingbirds, you can also supplement with nectar feeders. And uh, many of you guys are probably already doing this. You can make a sugar solution with one part white table sugar, which is not healthy for us, but the hummingbirds need that, that high caloric input in order to you know, buzz their wings. So it's uh, one part white table sugar to four parts water. That's a pretty close facsimile to most flower nectar. So you can fill up a hummingbird feeder and um, you just wanna make sure you empty it out regularly every few days in warm weather because it can spoil and that could be bad for the hummingbirds. So you can supplement the natural nectar sources for hummingbirds with a feeder. And if you're lucky enough um, to live in Arizona or New Mexico, you might actually also attract some of those nectar feeding bats. Pretty neat. All right, so that's food. Again, it's really mostly about plants. There's a couple of feeders that you can put out to supplement. Water for pollinators is even simpler. Um, you know, pollinators, again, are mostly insects, so, but they need a water source. And because they're so tiny, they're not going to visit probably like a big open body of water. So what you can do is make a, a, a bee bath is what I like to call it. You can get a bird bath or any shallow dish, fill it with pebbles, which will serve as landing places for bees and other pollinators so they can get a little bit of liquid. Um, and not have to worry about falling in and drowning. Because even if they did fall in, there's a place where they could climb out pretty easily. And again, these are non-native honeybees, but I think it's just such a cool picture. Um, you can see their little uh, you know, tongues basically coming out and they're sucking up the water, which they bring back to the hive and release and buzz their wings, forming a natural air conditioning. It's pretty amazing behavior. Um, for hummingbirds, you know, like any other bird, uh, a bird bath is something that will provide them with water. Hummingbirds love the sound of moving water. So if you add a fountain, you can even get these little things called misters that spray a little mist of water and the hummingbirds will kind of fly through it and kind of take a bath on the wing. So that's a way that you can provide water for them. Pretty simple. Even just a muddy area, a mud puddle, could be an important water source for pollinators. Butterflies, for example, engage in a behavior that's called puddling, where they come to this muddy area, which again, doesn't have standing water, so they, they don't have to worry about like, you know, falling into the water and drowning. They can land on the muddy, uh, the muddy soil and stick their proboscis, their mouth part in, and suck up the water, which has tons of dissolved minerals in it. 
So it's a really actually important nutrient source for them. So, you know, if you have that wet, muddy patch in your yard and you are gonna spend a lot of money putting in French drains and retaining walls and fill soil, just leave it as a mud patch, the pollinators will thank you. All right, so food is planting lots of native wildflowers and other blooming plants. Water is just a muddy area or a shallow dish filled with water and some rocks. Again, very simple, or a bird bath. The last two components have a lot of overlap with pollinators, so I'm kind of lumping them together here. They're cover and places to raise young. So cover really is just about wild, giving wildlife a place where they can hide from predators and get out of the elements. So again, your plants are gonna do the work here. If you, it's not so much what you plant when it comes to cover, it's how you plant. So plant densely. In other words, don't just have one flower plunked in the middle of your lawn. That's not gonna provide cover for anything. But if you plant you know, big swaths and groupings of plants and plant them close together and densely, you're gonna provide a lot of cover, lots of hiding places for pollinators and other wildlife. And it doesn't have to look messy. You know, This is a beautiful garden um, and it's mostly native plants and lots of animals find cover here as well as food. So you know, your native plants, if you plant them densely, are gonna do double duty. They're gonna be a food source and a host plant, which is places to raise young, um, I guess triple duty, and they'll also be a form of cover. So, um, and then for places to raise young, you know, the birds build nests and branches, hummingbirds as pollinators. So again, just plant lots of dense shrubs and you might get lucky and get hummingbirds nesting in your yard. Uh, we talked already about our native solitary bees. So if you have a kind of a dirt patch and you're seeing activity from these ground nesting bees, you absolutely want to protect that. Don't mulch over it. Don't plant ground cover there. Let the bees have that habitat. You can keep dead wood on your property. So if you have an old log or branches that you build into a brush pile or even a dead standing tree, as long as it doesn't pose any risk of falling and damaging your house or property or injuring someone, it's, you know, dead wood is full of life is the saying that we have at the National Wildlife Federation. And it's all sorts of life, but even pollinators will benefit from this. Again, wild native bees, 25% of them are nesting in tunnels that were excavated by termites or woodpeckers drilling in after those termites or carpenter ants or beetle larvae in that dead wood. So um, the other caveat, of course, is if you live somewhere where fire is a concern, you obviously don't want to do this. But it is one way that you can provide both cover and places to raise young for pollinators. Hot trend nowadays are butterfly houses and insect hotels. These are just structures that you either buy or build that have lots of little nooks and crannies in them that give insects a place to hide. Um, they can also potentially be used as nesting places um, in the case of our solitary bees that are looking for those little tunnels. There's not a lot of science on whether or not these are actually helping in the, you know, kind of in the, the ecological picture, but if nothing else, they're kind of a cool focal point in your garden. Um, you can get bumblebee nesting houses. Bumblebees are native bees that, um, that do form hives, they do live communally. And typically the queen, uh, the queen bumblebee emerges in the early spring from hibernating underground and she will fly around and look for a tunnel. Oftentimes they're using an old rodent burrow, an old mouse den or a chipmunk tunnel or something like that. And so these boxes are meant to kind of mimic that. Again, whether or not they are gonna be super effective at attracting bumblebees, Probably not, but you know you can always experiment and try with it. I know a lot of you guys really like putting out nesting boxes for birds, and this is just something that you can do specific to pollinators. You can also put out a bee house like this for the, the, the solitary bees that again are nesting in tunnels and plant stems and old wood. You, you can see all of these little tubes. They're all different sizes. Different native bees are looking for different size tubes and tunnels in which to nest. So this is something that you can do, but the caveat is that you have to maintain it. Just like with a bird nesting box, you can't just put it out and, and like never mess with it because the bees typically do not nest this close to each other in nature. And so when you put out something like this, it actually can end up attracting a lot of parasites and then it becomes kind of a sink for bees. They go in and they lay their eggs, but then the parasites get them all and it can actually be doing more harm than good. So if you want to put out a bee nesting house, what you want to do is make sure 
that it has removable tubes. A lot of, this is again a hot trend and I'm seeing a lot of these come on the market that are just not good design because the tubes don't come out. So you wanna get ones with replaceable tubes and then really what you should do is at the end of the season, so usually in most places around October or November, you pull out all those tubes that are filled with the, um, the eggs and the larva of the bees from earlier in the season and you store them someplace and then you put out fresh tubes the next spring and as the bees leave the old tubes, they'll go into the new ones and then you throw the old ones out. So it's a little bit of effort. Um, and if you're not willing to do it, that's totally fine. Just put out natural nesting areas and you won't have to maintain it. And this is just a tight shot of showing some of the tubes in a bee nesting house that I had in my yard um, that, uh, that were filled. You can see the little chamber wall there. You can put out mud. Mud is a really important building material for the chamber walls for native bees. And yes, I did have a bowl of mud in my yard. This served as a puddling area for butterflies, and it also served as a source of mud as a building material for native bees. If you see this, it doesn't mean your plants are dying. This is evidence of leaf cutter bees. Instead of using mud as those chamber walls and their nesting tunnels, they cut out little rounds of leaves and they use those. It's pretty neat. All right, so while we're talking about places to raise young, I wanted to come back to monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies are incredible. They're one of the only migratory insects. They can travel as much as 3,000 miles on their annual migration. There's two populations, the eastern, which is everything east of the Rockies, and the western, west of the Rockies. The majority of the monarch butterfly population is found within the eastern population. But these are incredible insects. Like I said, they migrate. And they do this over multiple generations. So, you know, every fall, the last generation hatched, um, triggered by the, the sunlight and weather, and we're still kind of learning what actually triggers it. All of them will migrate from, from Southern Canada, the Northern part of their range, all the way down to one spot in the mountains outside of Mexico City, where they overwinter in a few different colonies. It's pretty fantastic. And then in the spring, that generation will begin their northward migration. And they, once they reach, you know, sort of southern Texas, they mate, they lay eggs, and they die. And then it takes another subsequent three or four generations of reproduction over the course of the spring and summer before they repopulate the rest of the eastern, um, you know, kind of half or two-thirds of the country. The western population does the same thing, but instead of going to just one spot in Mexico, they kind of overwinter along the central to southern California coast. Um, so really, really fascinating insects, iconic. We all grew up knowing what a monarch butterfly is. Unfortunately, the monarch butterfly population is in big trouble. You don't have to read all the details on this chart, but this is the population chart for the eastern monarch population. You can see it goes down pretty dramatically. This is the western one. Ignore the line. Look at the green bars there's less than 1% of the Western monarch butterfly population left. There's, given it changes year to year, the Eastern population this year is down by roughly 70%. So both populations are in trouble. And the reason is that we have gotten really good at getting rid of their only caterpillar host plant, which is called milkweed. So you can help restore habitat for monarch butterflies and turn around this precipitous decline by planting native milkweed, which is their caterpillar host plant, and native nectar plants. Milkweed happens to be a nectar plant too. And you know, milkweed has a PR problem because it's got weed in the name, and we don't like to plant weeds, but a name is, is kind of irrelevant. Milkweeds, many of which are in cultivation, so you can buy them at garden centers or native plant nurseries, many of them are gorgeous. Well, we've got like almost a hundred different species of milkweeds native to North America. No matter where you live, there are some native milkweeds and they're beautiful, many of them. And they are great in the garden. So don't let anybody tell you that milkweed is a weed and that you shouldn't plant it in your garden. The monarchs will thank you. What you don't wanna do is plant tropical milkweed. And this is tough because this is the most common milkweed in cultivation. This is not native to North America, it's native to like Central America. And unfortunately, what we're finding is that though it grows great in the garden and the monarchs love to, you know, the caterpillars love to eat it, um, in the southern tier states at the bottom of the migratory route for uh, monarch butterflies, as well as in uh, California, the tropical milkweed does not die back 
in the winter the way that the native milkweeds do. And it's what it's doing is in some cases it's halting the migration of the monarchs so they don't complete their migratory cycle. And even worse, it's uh, sort of parasites or pathogens is the word I was looking for, build up in the milkweed and actually kill the monarchs. So avoid tropical milkweed, especially if you live you know, in the very southern tier states or California and plant native if you can. One thing that I just want to give a shout out for is our Mayor's Monarch Pledge. Um, we might be able to share some info on this in the chat, but this is a, an effort that we're promoting right now where your community leaders can make the commitment to restore habitat for monarchs in your community. It can be your mayor, but it can be other municipal level leaders. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, um, you know, we'll, we'll share more information on that in the chat. Really great program. All right, so at the end of the day, it's food, water, cover, places to raise young. And then the last thing that you need to do to create a good wildlife habitat garden, and if you wanna get it certified, you have to do this as well, is what we call a sustainable garden. Just garden naturally is what we mean. So what pollen, it's because pollinators are, their decline is being caused by us. And a lot of the things that we currently do in our yards and gardens are really bad for them. Pollinators are declining because of pesticide use and diseases that get spread when we introduce non-native species, climate change, et cetera. And just plain old habitat loss, you know, paving over everything and replacing the native plant communities with strip malls and pavement and lawns. It's really bad for pollinators. And this slide, you know, it's kind of darkly humorous, but it's true, especially for bees. You know, if bees disappear, human beings will, could, not, could not exist. Again, those honeybees are pollinating the majority of our crops. One in three bites of food we eat is the result of animal pollinators, most of which are those domesticated honeybees. About a quarter of our pollination for crops comes from our wild native bees, interestingly, but all of the native plants out there that are supporting all of the wildlife out there, um, the flowering plants are pollinated mostly by wild native bees and then these other pollinated wildlife. So, it's really that important. And this is what we're up against, right? I'm sure you have all seen properties like this. I see them all around the country, no matter where I go. And unfortunately, this doesn't support anything. It doesn't support much wildlife at all, let alone pollinators. So what our challenge is, is to help America go from this to something like this. You know, there's still some lawn there. I think of the lawn as, as people habitat. Um, you know, it's okay if you have some lawn, um, but if you can give over some of your property to beds filled with blooming native plants, it's going to go a long way in supporting the local pollinator population. And when I do it, and when you do it, and your neighbor does it, suddenly we have exponentially more pollinator habitat. And that is what is needed all across this country if we're going to turn the tide on bee decline, on monarch butterfly decline. And so it's up to all of us. It's a small action. We can all do it. It's really the epitome of that old idea of think globally, but act locally. And of course, don't spray pesticides. Don't spray herbicides, which will kill the plants that many pollinators need to survive. And of course, don't spray insecticides, which will kill most of our pollinators, which are insects, okay? So there are lots of great organic gardening techniques that you can employ at home that will avoid the necessity for spraying pesticides. All right, so wind down here. You can do this anywhere, not just in your backyard. You can do it in your front yard and your side yard, and you can do it on your patio and containers. You could do it at your office. You could do it at your kids' or your grandkids' schools, your work, all of that. So the idea here is that if you can plant something, you can create a pollinator habitat. And we want everybody out there to plant as many natives as possible everywhere all across America to support these important wildlife. When you do that, again, if you're interested, you can get it certified by the National Wildlife Federation. Again, this is just our way of recognizing your efforts to help out the pollinators. It's not mandatory. What we really want people to do is plant those pollinator gardens, but a lot of you like to be recognized and be able to post a yard sign and you know, kind of join the movement. And, and when you do, get certified and post the yard sign, you really do help us at the National Wildlife Federation to spread the word in a super grassroots way. You know, there's only so many people I can reach by doing a webinar like this, but if everybody on this, this, uh, this webinar right now got certified and posted a yard sign, millions more people would become aware 
of the idea of a wildlife habitat garden. So it's pretty powerful. You get a lot of different stuff with it when you get certified. And again, there is an application fee and there is a fee for the sign, uh, but those funds go right back into supporting this program. When you get certified, you get a personalized certificate. You can see that on the page here. You can get one of several different yard signs. Um, you get a membership to the National Wildlife Federation, a subscription to National Wildlife Magazine, a subscription to our e-newsletter, Garden for Wildlife. You get a 10% discount to our online shop that has a lot of Garden for Wildlife stuff in it. So lots of really great perks, but ultimately it's an honor system. I'm not gonna show up in your yard with a clipboard. There's no government oversight over it. It's you reporting to us on what you have going on for, uh, for Habitat. And if you meet the basic requirements, you can get certified. It's a great way to join the movement and help amplify our collective voice on behalf of wildlife. So here's that slide again with our special pollinator week discount. So if you go to our website and, and the URL is right there, it's nwf.org slash certify. You enter in the promo code GARDEN20 and you'll get that 20% discount. So I'll leave you with this. Again, go to our website, nwf.org. Tons more information on all of this there. Um, you can really do a deep dive, really great resources on native plants for wildlife, pollinator plants, you can use our native plant finder. You can put in your zip code here and we'll give you a list of the top caterpillar host plants found in your zip code. Pretty powerful tool. If you're on social media, you can visit us at our Garden for Wildlife group. And I know many of you are probably watching this now live on our Facebook group. We're also on Twitter at Garden the number four wildlife. So join us there. I mentioned our online store, our Garden for Wildlife shop. So you can get links to that on our website, but We've got, again, lots of different products that will help you support all sorts of wildlife pollinators included. And lastly, you can, at the, the shop or any, at any bookstore, you can get a copy of my book, which is called Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife. It's a how-to book. It'll walk you through step-by-step -step this entire process. There's plant lists, tons of beautiful pictures, step-by-step -step projects. So hopefully you'll pick that up. And again, the proceeds of the sale of the book go back to the National Wildlife Federation to help support our programs. So I know I've gone right up to the edge here. I always do this because there's so much info to cover, but I, I can hang on for another few minutes if anybody has questions. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Aaron. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. And um, let's see if Aaron is there and yes. um, there are any questions that popped up that I can answer. Yes, we have a couple of good questions. One of them was, um, I have a very small balcony. Do you have any recommendations for creating habitats on balconies or other small areas? Yeah, great question. So again, you can do this anywhere. So what I would encourage you to do is get into container gardening. So if you have a balcony, um, you know, depending on the size, you can fit you know, a handful of different containers, pots of different sizes, uh, which is just a design tip. You know, I wouldn't just do all pots of one size. I would do one really big one and then maybe several small ones, but a lot of um, native perennials and as well as native shrubs and maybe even small trees will thrive in a container. Things you want to think about with a container garden. You want to make sure that the pot itself is not too heavy, um, especially if you're, again, up on a deck or even a rooftop. So go for things like plastic or composite material versus like, you know, heavy, um, you know, kind of stone pots or, or clay pots. Um, you want to make sure that they get watered regularly. You know, a pot only has just so much surface area and they can dry out really fast in really hot temperatures and full sun. Um, you might have to be watering every single day, but that's okay. So I would start there maybe with just some native perennial wildflowers and you can supplement with some annual wildflowers that will give a little bit of an extra boost there. And periodically you do probably want to fertilize in a pot because the plants will deplete the nutrients in there and you can top dress with compost or buy natural fertilizers. And uh, it's something that you can do again, even on a balcony. Awesome, thanks Dave. We have one more here about um, butterfly weed. Instead of butterfly bush, is it okay to plant butterfly weed? Wonderful question. Yes, butterfly weed is a kind of milkweed. It's a perennial, it's an herbaceous perennial so it will die back to the ground. Um, in the winter months and then re-sprout from the roots. It is a uh, milkweed that tends to do well in average to drier soils and it's got a beautiful orange flower on it. It's a fantastic plant to plant for pollinators. It's a great nectar source. 
It is a milkweed and monarchs will sometimes lay their eggs on it, although it is not their most favorite milkweed to use as a host plant, but it's, uh, it's certainly very ornamental, highly available in the garden centers and a great plant for pollinators. As opposed to butterfly bush, which is a completely different plant um, that is a woody shrub. And that is what I was talking about earlier, which we don't really recommend you plant anymore because it can become an invasive non-native that destroys wildlife habitat. All right, we have one here about pamphlets or resources that can be handed out at events or printed. Yeah, so if you go to our website, which again is nwf.org slash garden, or you can just Google Garden for Wildlife, we're the first group that comes up. If you get to that Garden for Wildlife page, you can click on, I believe it's a button that says um, about, um, or it might say resources, Aaron, you might, you might know or have it pulled up. Anyway, on that website, we have a whole series of PDF tip sheets on a wide variety of subjects related to Garden for Wildlife that you are free to print out and distribute in your community. Yes, and it is under about and then resources. So right, it's about and then resources, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, and we did have another question about solitary bees and if they are also pollinators. Yes, all of our solitary wild native bees are important pollinators, as well as the, the native uh, social bees, like the honey or the bumblebees are also important pollinators. All bees are important pollinators. And again, I want to make sure that you all are aware about our wild native bees and that honeybees are great and they're important for agriculture, but they're not really wildlife and their decline is more of an ag issue than it is a wildlife conservation issue. So what we all really have the power to do is help out those wild native pollinators and bees that really need our help that are not getting the attention because everyone's so focused on the honeybee. And one other bee question, we have a few bee questions here. Do, where in the country do leaf cutter bees live? Where can we find them? So there's a few different species and I'm pretty sure that they are found in most parts of the country. Again, there's 4,000 species of bees and I'm not a bee specialist myself. So um, I can't quote for you the exact range, but I'm pretty sure there's a few different species. There are some non-native ones that have become established here. It's really hard to tell them apart. Um, but, uh, but I'm pretty sure leafcutter bees can be, can be found pretty much coast to coast. All right. Well, um, I think there's a few other questions that I can answer, I can type in the answers for, but I think that's for the most part, most of them. Okay. Um, well, I, yeah, with that, I want to be respectful of folks' time and we are now over uh, 4 p.m. So let me just say thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for caring about pollinators. Thank you for participating in the National Wildlife Federation's programs and supporting our work to help all wildlife, but pollinators in particular. Please do follow us on social media. Uh, you can follow me on social media as well. In most places, I'm either naturalist David Mizajewski or um, just D. Mizajewski. If you go to my website, which is naturalist.nwf.org, you can get links to all of my social media pages. I just launched a YouTube channel. So I'm looking for folks to go there and like my videos. So, um, but I'm happy to follow up and answer any other questions if you reach out to me on social media. Um, and uh, that way we'll get you all the information that you need. So with that, I'm gonna close this out. And just again, thank you again for caring about pollinators. And I can't wait uh, to do this again next year. Maybe you guys can share some of your amazing pollinator garden photos with everybody else for inspiration. So happy National Pollinator Week, everyone. Thank you, David. And I just wanted to, we had one more question about oh. how to certify and what the promo code is. Oh, sure. Yeah. So if you go again to our website, nwf.org slash garden, um, you can click on the certify button. There's a couple different spots on the website that have it there. Um, and when you go through that process, it's an honor system application. It's a checklist. So you'll see all the different ways you can provide food, water, cover, places to raise young and practice sustainable gardening. You check off all the things that you're doing and our system, you know, we basically have minimum requirements in each of those categories. Our system will tally it all up. And if you meet those basic requirements, you're eligible to get certified and you'll go through the process. And then um, the promo code, Aaron, remind me what the promo code is. The I don't promo have code is GARDEN20. 
GARDEN20. And that's good through the end of June and you'll get a 20% discount off of whatever your, your, you know, the fee ends up being if you choose to buy a sign on top of your application fee. So it's a great deal. And again, you know, the wildlife can't read the sign. That's not what this is about. But um, when you do certify, like I said, you do join our movement and that really amplifies our voice and, and you become a way of spreading the word to all of your neighbors and friends and family who are going to come see your sign that this is an important thing that, that we can do. All right. Thank you, David. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to sign off, but I'm um, happy pollinator gardening, everyone. Thank you.